La Feria Internacional del Libro de Guadalajara presenta The International Guadalajara Fair Book, Book Fair. Today, hello, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. We don't know exactly when you are going to listen to us, whether through this live uh, streaming or when it is going to be recorded for the internet uh, to view in the future. I am Alberto Chimal and I welcome you to this third and last a uh, call for uh, short story uh, writers that is going to have uh, that uh, the book fair is going to have this year in a virtual manner now this international uh, encounter of short story writers has been held now virtually in guadalajara and has gathered more than a hundred authors from all Latin America and Spain and some other countries. And the objective of this, as was proposed by the Mexican author uh, Ignacio Padilla, has to, uh, was to offer to this uh, attendees to our book fair uh, an overview of uh, short stories produced by leading authors currently working. And when Nacho uh, passed away, and this was very unfortunate, it was in uh, 2016, I was invited to continue his work. So it is an honor for me. So here I am. So this year we have held two sessions with Mariana Enriquez, Bernardo Esquinca, Lilia Jorge, the winner uh, that was, uh, she was awarded with a uh, Hill Award and Eduardo Halpur. So now to complete our program, here we have today with us, so we get acquainted with part of their job. We have here Maria Fernanda Ampuero and Marcelo Luján. So I'm going to read a very brief information about them. Maria Fernanda Ampuero, she's an author and she's also a journalist from Ecuador. She has she was born in Guayaquil. She has lived in both Mexico and Spain and this is what has shaped her work. And after having been awarded as a journalist and also uh, having been awarded by uh, the uh, International Journalist Association, she has all, she has also been awarded with her first by her first uh, short story book. She was also awarded with a, a short stories Lara. She was also considered a great author at uh, the New York Times in Spanish, and she has been awarded with Goseña Enya for short stories. And part of her of her work has been translated into English, Italian, and uh, very soon she will be translated into Portuguese and Greek. And also we have here with us today, Marcelo Luján, who is an Argentinian author. She lives currently in Spain. She has written short stories, novels, and poetic prose. In 2016, she was awarded with Dasha Hammer and Nobel Paul in Santa Cruz City. And today she has a, he has added a horror aspect to his uh, writing by his book, Clarity, who has been awarded, that has been awarded with Rivera del Duero. Then we have Florida, flowers to Irene and somewhere in heaven that have been awarded with Santa Cruz de Tenerife, Alcala City for Narrative 2016 and uh, Sebastian Award 2007. He has been translated into French, uh, Czech and Bulgarian. And these are our two authors today. So I'm going to ask Maria Fernanda Ampuero to start today with her presentation. So first of all, I want to say thank you. I want to thank the International Book Fair. Thank you for having invited me again. Back again, I imagine organizers of this session must be at ease because we are not a hangover. We do not have a hangover authors in this um in this edition, I want to thank Alberto for having thought about me. And I send a big kiss to Marcelo. I'm going to tell you about a story that is called The Auction. Somewhere there are some uh, cocks and here I'm kneeling 
uh, with my head down and covered with a very dirty cloth. I am concentrated on listening to this chicken uh, singing. I wonder if they are uh, in a in a cage. And my father, he used to be, he used to have cocks fighting. The first times I was there, I cried because I would see the cock dying on the sand, and he would laugh. And at the end, I got to see enormous cocks and vampires to come and eat my guts. And I would scream out and my grandfather came to my bed and he would tell me, little woman, please don't be such a little woman. They're animals, they're cocks, and they're there to fight. And then I wouldn't be crying from seeing this... Uh, small animals dying over the sand. I was the one who would gather all the feathers and all their guts to bring them to the garbage can, uh, garbage bin. And I would say goodbye, goodbye little chicken, go to heaven and be there. Happy, be happy there. You're going to find corn and uh, beautiful fields and you're going to have worms to eat. And there was always some owners of this cockfighters, he would give me a coin or uh, just for caressing their uh, their uh, rosters. And sometimes I was so afraid that I could tell my father and he would say, Oh you you don't cry. You know these are these are chickens that have to fight. But one night one chicken his uh, belly exploded its belly exploded and i was carrying him as a doll and you know all these people were crying out and they were at the same they feel disgusted from seeing this dead animal so i would go there and clean them up and i would fill my hands my knees with their blood so the people other peers of my of of my father and grandfather they would say oh your daughter she's a monster and he would say no you're more monsters than her and then they would drink some liquor and they would say cheers and you know the smell inside these chicken cages is so uh, horrible and sometimes I would sleep there and I would have one of these people owners of the cocks that would stare at me and then you know I was wearing my school uniform so prior to falling asleep I would have uh, a chicken by the middle of my legs and you know it would be one or too many and then uh, having you know lifted my my skirt and having some heads that had been torn out during fighting was so horrible for them as well and sometimes my father would make me pick up these dead roosters and then they would say why do you have this girl here wouldn't you clean this chicken yourself and he would live there uh, carrying the dead animals and then kiss them good goodbye and they would laugh all oh, and i don't i know that somewhere nearby there's some chicken because i would recognize that smell from kilometers away the smell from my father uh, and my childhood and having all these smells like blood like like grease like gasoline it is not you don't need to be so intelligent to know this is clandestine and i am i am i am really really screwed up and there was a man probably who would be 40 back then and i imagine him fat bald and and dirty wearing these shorts and a plastic uh sandals and i know he has his um little fingers nail very very long and i know there are some other people kneeling down bringing their head down and just covering their faces to avoid the smell and you know the first person that would make some noise i would shut them up and if we are here if we survive to everything that is happening now we are going to leave this place alive this place alive and i feel the gun near to my head he's not uh, joking and there's some other girl crying nearby i think she's not able to feel the gun by her head and and you know nobody would cry here you know uh, little princess now maybe you want to go and say hello to god tonight and you know the person with this gun has left he's calling over the telephone and he says six six damned people very good selection very good selection the best selection in months so please do not lose this election and then he's calling some other people and he forget about about us and somebody's coughing somebody who has this 
face covered as well and i hear he is a man and he has said i have heard about this earlier and i thought this was a legend this is called an auction the auction and taxi drivers choose passengers that they think they would serve to be paid for so that's why they are kidnapped and then buyers come and they would auction and they would bet for those that they prefer the people they prefer and they would keep their things and they are forced to to uh, to be robbed to open their homes to give them their credit card numbers and women you know to women what about women i ask and then he knows i am a woman he is aware to see i am a woman and then he shuts up the first thing i thought when i uh stepped on the taxi i thought finally i have a taxi to get back home and i closed my eyes i had drank some uh i had had some drinks and i was so sad and then at that bar there was the man that i had to uh finish my friendship with and his wife too and i was faking but when i stepped on the taxi I thought, oh, this is so great. I'm getting back home and there I can uh, scream and cry. I think I slept for a moment and when I woke up, I was at an unknown city, a polygon that was so empty, so dark, and the alarm that was making my, my brain boil. Now I know my life has fucked up. Up. and then the taxi driver looked to my eyes and he's with a gun and he said we're finally we finally reached reached our destination and then we had something very quickly somebody opened the door before i was able to lock it and then he threw this piece of cloth to my head and tied my hands up and he put me in this place that smell that smells like a rotten chicken and I can hear some conversations away. The fat man is talking to somebody, but then there's another man and another man. People come by and I can feel that they are opening some uh, beer cans. And also I can feel the, the other others. And the man next to me, he no longer says become because he must be saying or telling himself this and and then he told me about a baby that was three years old and an eight months baby he's maybe thinking about this and these drugged people that are now entering their ho uh, his home and he's thinking about that and he, he, him saying hello to the guard by the entrance as every night while well, he has these other two people behind him these two beasts that are going to get into his house with his beautiful wife his eight month baby and his three year old, year -old child he's bringing these people into his house and he cannot do anything about this and beyond that by the right there is some murmur some girl is crying i don't know if this is the same girl that cried before and the fat man shuts his shoots his gun and we go to the ground he has not shot at us he has simply shut his gun but we are terrified split by half and then the fat man laughs and his two peers come closer and they bring us to the center of this hall ladies and gentlemen tonight's auction is open they look so beautiful please be nice and now you're going to bless yourself darling come here come here don't be afraid i will not bite you this is the way i like it now this gentleman can choose from you who they will take and the rules are the same as always the more money the best garment you can take or the best person you can take and i'm going to keep your guns right here and i'm delighted to have you here tonight the third man will introduce us as he was presenting a tv show we cannot see any of these people, but we know these are thieves looking at us, choosing from us. And I am certain there are rapers and killers among them, or maybe, maybe something worse. Ladies and gentlemen, the fat person the fat man he doesn't like those who cry or those who say i have children or those who cry out you don't know who you're messing with no 
he doesn't like either those that menace him by telling him he would rot in jail. And all these men and women have been punched by the head or by the stomach. And I have heard some people fall down, but I'm thinking only about the rosters. There's probably no chicken around, but I can listen to them. And I know there's men and chicken. And please don't be such a, a girl. These are only uh, cock owners. And they are going to the, the, this roster, on, and this roster uh, owners, and they're here to have their fights. Uh, their fights. And, you know, there's this person who is having this brand, uh, branded clothes and very good clothes. And then, uh, Ricardo, open your wallet. Oh, we have credit cards here. We have Visa. And this is a Messi's goal. And then there's the auction occurring they are uh, betting and there's 800 500 dollars being offered but eduardo lives somewhere in a beautiful place in the suburb uh, in the suburbs those where the poor people would never go there and look at the beautiful sights and so i can call him ricky probably as ricky Ricon, this cartoon character and this is such a terrifying voice that has picked ricardo and the others would applaud and this has been assigned to the person with the mustache by for five thousand dollars and nancy his her voice is so so thin the fat man goes and says look how beautiful tits she has and this is something that he's saying while he touches her and who would prevent him from touching her nancy she sounds like she's 20 something she could be a nurse or she could be a school teacher nancy she's um now she's naked because the fat person the fat man has ripped her clothes off and she's so afraid and she calls all the time and now we're all crying all crying and now the clothes covering covering my head is wet with tears and now this fat man is going to lick her vagina her anus and the man the rest of the men are applauding are growling and now this is the hauling the hor horrible hauling when he is breaking her skin this is not a vice this is quality control she's scored 10. you can clean her up and then you're going to enjoy nancy she must be beautiful because immediately they offer two thousand three thousand three thousand and five hundred they sell nancy for three thousand and five hundred sex is cheaper than silver and the fortunate person that will take this uh, beautiful uh, beautiful um, pussy she's going it's going to be so fortunate so we sell ourselves and the boy next to me who has this eight year old uh, month baby and a three year old child now it's the most money from him he's very very wealthy he has silver uh, he has money in several bank accounts he has beautiful house work hard a wife children so this is like winning the lottery probably he's going to be kidnapped and then a ransom is going to be requested so they uh, start bidding five thousand uh, ten thousand twenty thousand and there's somebody nobody wants to mess around twenty thousand this is a new voice coming only coming here only for this and he's not here to waste any time the fat man would say nothing when it is my turn I think about the chicken again. I close my eyes and I open my sphincter. This is the most important thing I will do in my life. So I will do this the right manner. So I wet my own legs, my feet, the ground. I'm by the center of this hall, of this room that is surrounded with criminals. I'm being exhibited in front of all them as if I was a cow. And the same as a cow, I would empty my stomach and I 
if I can, I will scrub my legs one against the other and I scream and I shake my head and I uh, curse and there are so many new words I have invented and the same things I would say to the chicken that would die that they would go to heaven to eat worms forever and I know the fat man is about to shoot me but he would punch my mouth and then I bit my tongue and the blood is coming onto my my chest and then mix with mixes with my uh my urine and i start laughing and laughing and laughing and then the fat man doesn't know what to do with me so he says how much for this monster nobody offers anything and the fat person the fat man offers my wallet my my watch my uh, my cell phone but everything is cheap and then he would grab my teeth and i cry and cry 15 20 nobody offers anything so i'm thrown to some uh, patio and then I am washed with a hose and then I'm on a car all wet barefoot and all confused by the perimeter of the city thank you so much Maria Fernanda thank you for having read your short story now we have Marcelo Hello, everybody. Thank you for having invited me to this universe that is so much loved by all the Spanish speakers, which is International Guadalajara's International Book Fair. And I'm going to read to you a short story from the anthology. I'm going to, re to read only a third of this. Uh, my short stories are long, so I'm going to read only one third, which is called A Bad Moon. And this is uh, complete in the anthology you can download. And it says, when we were children one night, I woke up and I found her standing without moving very close to the wall. And that, then I saw her naked, uh, her bare uh, back and her hair was all messed up. And I was seven, seven years and my, uh, my brother would be 10. We were sleeping in the same room room i don't know why i woke up it was only when i approached her and i touched her otherwise i would think i would be dreaming and i asked what why, what are you doing she had open eyes and i touched her shoulder to ask her what are you doing but she would be without moving her eyesight fixed on some uh, spot on the wall and then i ran to my bed and i covered my head and if later on i would talk about this they would say no no you didn't dream or they would say no you are dreaming you are i didn't dream no but this happened when i was awake i was not sleeping i am certain and all the time we had gotten along very well my my sister and i lizard lizard she would say from top from the top are you awake from the, the bed uh, on top of me this was when the last year when we shared our room and then we were separated and nothing was the same lizard lizard are you awake we would sleep in these twin beds that would crack even when we did not move and sometimes we laughed from the noise that came out from the wood and i think this happened very late at night probably at midnight when our parents were sleeping so that's why we had to whisper words and we would repress our laughter always uh, digging our mouth uh, in our hands are you awake i was always awake and i would tell my my sister i'm always awake and she would come down by the ladder and would uh, be with me in my own bed we would keep quiet we wouldn't say anything and she was next to me crunching her legs and her arms and without asking i would hold her uh, up and then uh, uh, sticking my body to her body and it feels so nice to be to be here and i remember her smell she would smell like almonds but she would not behave like that with other people she was a problem girl and she always always made our parents uh, get mad and she, she had to visit the school so often because uh, teachers would say she's very complicated she is really difficult to to deal she would 
get she wouldn't get along with anybody and she would have very dispersed attention and my father would be working so my mother was there at school and i would watch her at school with a dark uh dark face although she would uh, paint her lips she would look very very concerned about my sister and when she was in fourth year she would beat her peers her classmates and then she would fight with the girls during the break and would ex uh, wait for other girls to come to the bathroom and then she would beat them up strong hard and in a bathroom the girls couldn't speak escape and she would cry out for help but they wouldn't be listened and she would uh, pull their hands and would punch their faces and uh, one girl got her uh, mouth hurt and another one was the split head and we would see my sister coming out from the bathroom and she would be she would look like take uh, being out from a horror movie and then uh, she also kicked some uh, boys uh, testicles during break and then I I saw this boy running and I knew my sister had done something to him and the boy was on the ground and he started seizing uh, he started having a seizure and they had to call emergency some teachers were running and I didn't know where to put uh, myself so my sister Lou she was called by by the principal and she was uh brought to different schools two or three times but she was always violent every week every week she would bring problems every month should be she would be suspended and this is when the school was paralyzed the schools all the schools were paralyzed because nobody knew what to do with her and the last resource it was that she was forced to go to see a psychology and i think by the second or third visit she would split on her psychologist and there were two psychologists together but she would split on them or she would probably punch them and then after having punched one they call them you are bitches so my sister was all alone all the time everybody was afraid from her your sister your sister the weird one your sister the crazy one and those people who didn't know she was my sister well i didn't want to know they wouldn't don't to know that they would know that she was my sister so we would leave our house together but then i would walk faster nobody should see us getting together at school and some sometimes she would say if we're at school don't even look at me if we're at home well we would get along and we would speak to each other this was not a joke for me but then in october when we began our last year at school after a very terrifying uh, scene she was ex uh, suspended definitely from school and my mother cried the whole afternoon she didn't even cook dinner and i asked why why are you crying and she would say it's nothing it's nothing and then she looked she locked herself up in her room and then after having not ha not wanting to know i i knew what was what had happened she was accepted in a school in a very far away place because my father had a friend who could have her there my mother say you can go and be a, a, and and go to this boarding schools and you would never see us and she was insulted and and my mother she looked like crazy that afternoon and my sister said nothing my father who didn't speak much he didn't speak to my sister for one whole month so that la that year the last year of school everything changed although i don't know exactly when everything started changing i don't know why so it was as if she was transforming herself into something else into someone else always introverted she stopped calling me lizard and she forbid me to come into the room with the twin bed and then i didn't i didn't know why and although i tried to hide this this was a very a special day because this is the the very last day when we were able to share something something broke because she was 12 and she looked 
16 and it was so uh, a pity to get to see to leave her to leave her uh, and watch her leaving home only with herself and i knew that she would be traveling so far away to get to school and she would be kidnapped or she would appear someday all in pieces in one box and then we had to wait for one day we had to wait for her to come any together and my mother would say we have to wait for your sister sometimes she would come back one hour later and my mother would always watch uh the clock in order to see when and thinking when lou would be back and thinking she wouldn't be back and one day we were wait, waiting for her sitting by the table and the telephone rang my mother looked at me as as if she was sure this was disgrace coming from that telephone call so she told me pick up the phone um, they say they want to talk with you or with dad and she, and i got back to the table my mother approached the telephone and she looked pale even white and when uh Lou would come out from her room and we went, when we met together by the TV room, she told me very strange things, things that were not proper for her age. And then she would reveal me strange things. And I am certain that Lou searched for me because she needed to speak with me and she would leave her room only to speak with me, to tell me the things she would say. She wouldn't say anybody because she had nobody to talk with. And she would tell me, that she will commit suicide and oh no no that's a joke and she would show her arms to me all scratched with cuts and also she told me that there was this old lady appearing to her bedside early in the morning that would have that would observe her without speaking an old lady like grandmother who's that and who would that be? She only uh, is there by the middle of the room, uh, staring, and she would tell me these things, very strange things. So uh, we were about to end the school year when a man approached her uh, when she was leaving school, and she said, "If you, if you make oral sex to me, I will give you five thousand uh, euros." And, and then we were there, and and she was telling me this by sitting by the coach. We were watching this uh, TV program that I loved so much, and we had always gotten along so so well. But there was a specific moment, and I don't know when, when she started to change is it, is it was as if some shadow would cover her i loved her so much more even than my parents and i was so powerless and so helpless and she simply vanished away thank you marcelo now we're having questions we're having questions from people who are watching this remotely and first i want to remind you that this anthology of this international encounter of short storytellers can be downloaded for free from the international book fair web page and here we have there we have the full versions of the short stories presented today and also there you can find um digital copies of previous anthologies for those who want to know about those who have been previously at this short story uh, authors that we have presented earlier and this streaming is going to be recorded for you to watch later and it is going also to be uh, in English if you want to watch them in that language so I am announcing this here is uh, there's something else also these two authors books are uh, available for sale here in Mexico and different uh, virtual bookstores and also through Amazon Amazon has an agreement now with Phil um, Guadalajara so you can have these books sent to you so now we are going to start with the questions from our viewers this i think is a good question to start they uh, david is telling us when a short story tells us about uh, some social problem do you write this as a protest or just just to have some catharsis I don't know. I don't know, David. This is an excellent question. I 
right out of range. So I think uh, this can be either either option that you said, I am so enraged. I am so, so enraged from what's happening mostly to women, but it is happening to all the victims, victims of all kinds of inequality. And I am enraged because this is not important to stop the world enough, not important enough to stop the world. And when I know about the figures that are terrible, that 11 women on a daily basis will not get back home in Mexico, 11 people. And that is infuriating. This is truly, truly uh, humanity crimes. And this is just horrible. If this is genocide, genocide to a specific human group, the planet should stop. Everybody should be speaking about this. However, every time we have less space to talk about femicides, either in newspapers or either in conversations, when this is a situation that is absolutely normal regular regular while we are speaking some woman is being as uh, is being killed so i'm so infuriated so it is out of rage and as a catharsis as well yes absolutely absolutely maria fernanda i agree with you totally and writing short stories to me this is the most wonderful the most beautiful and most difficult to, to write. I think we Latin Americans think about these stories as short stories being cathartic or being, or coming out from rage, these short stories. Uh, writing fiction is an intellectual tool for us to tell what we think about our surroundings, about the environment. We make use of short stories and uh, fiction uh, as a tool to tell what we think the same as a painter would use a canvas for. We are really um, approaching these short stories. It could be through a novel or it could be through a short story and we both prefer short stories. Now, a question linked to the previous one sent by Elisa. Uh, how much does journalism help you in your writing or uh, it is not so? No, I'm sorry. No, you are a journalist, so you can answer to this question much better. Well, I think there are many answers to this question. Very good question. And I think what I would choose to say is, it is that it is so important for me by telling about a reality. If I use journalism as the exercise to do that, so readers feel they have been at that place at that place that I have been to. I know that journalism is a tool also, a traveling tool. What journalism does is that it tells stories. It tells someone about what happened at a specific place where, uh, and this is a specific place where the readers will never be. So I try to be very loyal to what I see and I try to be very loyal to convey what I see, which is not exactly the same. And I feel that this has been left as probably in me as a professional deformity. Uh, and I'm, I excuse myself because I'm thinking about deformity. And I think in myself, I, uh, journalism has stuck into my writing style. I need you to see what I am seeing. I need you to smell it. I need you to listen to the noise around, to touch it, to sense it. So you are correct. In that sense, journalism is part of myself, is part of what I am. No, I am not a journalist, but I agree with Maria Fernanda. And I want to quote one of the very few uh, great journalist author that was Gabriel Garcia Marquez reading his journalism work. It's just wonderful. He tells us about the 
coast of his country and about Europe because he would do journalism with a lit literary style, which is so great. Not all journalists are good authors and not all authors are able to convey the things as a journalist would do. And I wanted to bring Gabriel Garcia Marquez back to our chat, to our session here, because it is so important. Thank you so much. Another question. This is ex specifically to Maria Fernanda. Why is it that uh, you don't have a name for your main character? Well, I think that this question, dear reader, you don't do this from an innocent standpoint because if things are not named, things that are not named are sacred, like the name of God, for example and also things that have no name can be just anyone. So it seemed to me, actually, I had the name by the beginning in a very, very first draft of this short story. I had a name for her, but then I realized she's a symbol. And as long as I was able to erase, because there's no physical characteristics, characteristics to describe her, there's no age for her. So as long I, as I could erase from her all her personal features, I would be, I would be able to encompass a largest amount of, uh, of people. So this is something that we authors do unconsciously. It is easier for us to be in the place of people that have no name because then we are able to fill the gaps with our own information that's on one hand and also i think she's a sacred character she's my superheroine i am not writing short stories uh, like marvel's stories i wanted her to have some epic in her and at the end that she was saved as she was Thank you so much. Now this question is to Marcelo. How is it that you give character to your characters? Or, uh, well, that's a difficult question. That's a difficult question. How am I able to bring personality to my characters? Well, is there a story? There's a story that I want to say. I think that this is what will make me make my first technical decisions that refer to the composition and description of each character. And I was just reading a while ago uh, about a boy uh, that is just coming out of age that misses his sister so much and about this writing well the thing is i have no sister so i have no ideas about how a boy would feel so we authors we writers should have among other abilities uh, the capacity to to construct characters that we never were that we know nothing about that we didn't grow up with and, and that we are able to imagine their everyday life so having a personality and having constructed characters this is so important for me to tell a story and there is no character above the other and i'm talking about from the fiction standpoint thank you erica she's making two questions that are linked to each other well she's asking you when a short story is uh, written should you have a scheme and how do you work uh, the closing of a short story marcelo please you answer that oh this is a beautiful question to those of us who love the, the genre well there is no magic formula uh, Maria Fernanda, Alberto, you know about this, there is no magic formula to write a short story. So I will tell you from my own standpoint, when I write a short story, I need to have uh, the end in my mind, the great ending, uh, the outcome. I need to know my destination because short stories is a genre that, sh that sh shall not allow us to get distracted. If you get distracted, then the short, the short story is ruined. So for me, 
not to fall into any distractions. So there is no secondary doors that make me change, change destinations. I need to have a light by the end of the tunnel. And that's one of my tools or mechanisms to approach a short story. It works to me. And more than anything, it allows me to think. It allows me uh, to know that this is inherent to the short story. And even from Cortázar's standpoint, that's my, my key tool for me to approach stories through sh uh, short stories. It is not always as I propose myself to do it because short stories are so extraordinary that they would develop themselves. So that's the tool I use knowing the end. And when it comes out fine, it comes out fine. Otherwise, you know, it would go to that binder that nobody would read. Those stories nobody would read. I have no, no formula either for anything in my life. I use no formula. Actually, I am very bad for that. I am a good cook, but I am terrible uh, to follow recipes. I wouldn't be the granny that, you know, everything she pre she makes tastes always the same. So, you know, I would cook differently every day. And it's the same for me uh, when I write. I'm chaotic, actually. And order makes me... Uh, or there is opposite to my personality and my uh, style of living. And it makes me so nervous. It is as when you open an Excel sheet and you don't know what to do with it. It's the same. I, I am totally opposite to what an Excel sheet is. So for me, I only allow things to come by to pass through me and it is like and i don't want to th to talk about magical uh thinking and the muse and it is nothing like that i have to work my texts but there is a first moment and that it would be like child labor child labor that i go through where when everything would just come out whatever it is sometimes it is very painful and it would take so long time, but sometimes it's very easy. And then there's a the time to, to sewing and uh, placing the stitches on this hole that was made through the, through the birth of, uh, of the short story. And that's a second stage, but I am very organic when I write. It is like, like giving birth, just like that. Thank you so much. And Pepe is asking, who are the uh, short story writers that have marked your writing? No, no, short story uh, tellers or storytellers that have marked you. This is so horrible. I am, I am thinking of something else. I'm sorry, because Marcelo heard something else. Oh, yeah, that's because Marcelo and I have met together or we met and we have been friends for 15 years already. Yes. Well, the short story that Maria Fernanda read, uh, The Auction, I listened to that same short story some time ago, and this is this is so wonderful to have and listen to it again. I have to say Marcelo, and please excuse me for adding this. Marcelo was uh, directing some writing jam, writing jam sessions in some bar in Madrid, and it was the epicenter for many uh, writers from my generations. We gathered there all those that were writing or wanted to write we met together in madrid madrid and thanks to these jam sessions organized by marcelo that i got encouraged to really really come out of the fiction writer closet and this is when i decided i uh, to tell the world i am uh, i am an author excellent and it is true the cycle the premise was short stories writing short stories that was the premise we needed of course the storytelling but mostly we were talking about short stories and that was uh, the principle the premise for those writers who wanted to approach this jam session so it is so nice that maria fernanda brings these memories back and i have to say cortaza has influenced me and o'connor 
who has been an author who has really, really uh, influenced me. And I know Latin American short stories are so great uh, at an international level. Juan Rulfo, for sure, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. This is an endless list. And in Argentina, as it happens in many Latin American countries, we love the genre. We, when we read stories in the university, short stories, we would read uh, Juan Rulfo and Adolfo in our uh, uh, when we were in college. And I don't know if Maria Fernanda she can mention other other authors. Well. I have to uh, set the advertise here. I want to give this advertisement that the book that has just been published, that has just come out from uh, the printing press. It is called Vindictas from our publishing house, from my, ho my home, uh, which is exactly the same, has recovered many short stories from authors or uh, narrators, short story writers that from Latin America that unfairly had been forgotten, or I think Socorro Banegas, who has directed this anthology, she has said that it is not that we have forgotten because there was no memory, there was no appreciation for these short stories and these short stories writers. So that anthology, we have the short story of Gilda Holmes from Ecuador as well. And when I started college and I was 18 years old, she was so important to me because it was the first time ever that I read something that referred to uh, women's experience as something unpleasant to the rest of the people. The symbol that Gilda Holtz uses is the bad smells that comes out from women, like uh, vagina others and the and the disgust we could cause to others and I am certain now that I got back to read that short story and when I thought about it in that specific moment in my life it was about this scatology that it is included in this short story I I, I read to you it was so important to me that a writer from Ecuador from my own city she would appear approach such, um, such a subject that is not spoken by women normally. So by the rules I, I grew up with, like Gabriela Mistral writing for young children, and when women were writing different kinds of uh, literature, very romantic, very childish and then having the strength of nature talking about smells her smell would cause disgust to a group of men that opened my perspective fully and somebody that i have always loved all my life i have loved oscar wilde canterville's uh, ghost i think this is one of the short stories i most love in life so i wanted to bring oscar wilde to this table. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for your recommendations. And I want to end up by reading a comment to you that I think is very, very timely. Thank you for giving voice to characters that are unhappy and non-perfect. Reflecting rage and reflecting misery in these short stories gives peace to those minds that we that we want to think we shall not be the princess of the of the story. I think this is very timely comment, and it represents a very important point of contact with much of the valuable things and ideas that you offer to us today and this is how we wrap up our session and I am uh, I, I'm so sorry because there's so much more to say and there are so many questions here that we need to ask ourselves later on when we meet together when we bring others together whether we meet in Madrid or elsewhere and in the meantime, I want to thank uh, Marcelo Luján and Maria Fernanda Ampuero for having been in this virtual uh, call. 
and I want to thank everybody who are here today and that we will see this later on in the future. Hopefully next year we are going to be able to be back uh, under normal situation when we meet together, when short story writers meet together, but I am certain we will meet soon. Thank you so much and see you soon.